Number 10. Fiat L640 Tank Built by Fiat, the L640 was a light tank used by the Italian military during World War II. Introduced in 1940, it was deployed in battles against the Soviet Union as well as the Balkans Campaign and the North African Campaign. The tank was also used for defending Italy and Sicily throughout the war. Only three of the armored vehicles are still around to this day. One, which likely saw combat during the Balkans campaign, sits outside Giro Castor Castle in Albania. Dating back to the 12th century or earlier, the fortress functions as a military museum commemorating the communist struggle against imperial Western powers. In addition to the L640 tank, the site is home to a captured U.S. Air Force plane, as well as captured artillery from the resistance against German occupation. Giro Castor Castle is a lesser known tourist site despite all of its rich history. The decommissioned tank stands in solitude as a lonesome reminder of one of the darkest chapters in European history. The other two surviving L640s are in Lignano, Italy, and at the Kubinka Tank Museum outside Moscow. Number 9. U.S. Sperry and Retired Nuclear Submarines Named for American inventor and entrepreneur Elmer Sperry, the USS Sperry was a type of ship called a submarine tender, which supplies and supports submarines. Built for the U.S. Navy in 1941, she was launched just 10 days after the infamous Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. During World War II, the USS Sperry spent several months in Australia where she refitted seven submarines. In early 1943, the vessel traveled to Pearl Harbor where she spent four months refitting 10 submarines. From there, the ship headed to Midway Atoll in the South Pacific where she saw the busiest period of her career. Over a span of five months, the Sperry serviced 70 submarines. Throughout the remainder of the war, the ship traveled back to Pearl Harbor, then to Majuro Atoll in the Marshall Islands before heading back to Pearl Harbor. Then she went to the Marianas Islands, then to Guam, and finally back to the U.S. After World War II ended, the Sperry ended up at the Long Beach Naval Shipyard near Los Angeles, where she underwent a modernization program in 1961. For 20 years, the vessel serviced submarines out of San Diego. She was finally decommissioned in 1982 and spent years sitting at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Washington alongside a collection of derelict nuclear submarines that had also been taken out of service. The ship was finally sold to a private buyer in 2011 for $1,526,726, with plans to be dismantled. By then, the Sperry had been relocated to Sioux Sun Bay outside San Francisco, where it sat among a fleet of rusting military ships. It was finally scrapped that year. Number 8. Prince Eugene The Prince Eugene entered service in August 1940 at the beginning of World War II as a type of Nazi naval warship called a heavy cruiser. The U.S. ultimately captured the vessel as a war prize and used it for atomic bomb tests at Bikini Atoll, which is part of the remote Marshall Islands archipelago in the South Pacific. In 1946, the Prince Eugene was nuked twice during these tests and capsized. It was one of dozens of vessels that were bombed as part of a project called Operation Crossroads, which sought to examine the effects of nuclear weapons on warships. Naturally, the Prince Eugene was dangerously radioactive after the experiment. The military tried and failed to decontaminate it several times, then towed it to Kwajalein Atoll where it sank six months later. It's still visible today, sitting upside down in the shallow water with its propellers peeking out above the surface. In 1974, experts predicted that the ship would start leaking oil into the ocean within the next 30 years if no cleanup efforts were made. The U.S. Army and Navy finally heeded these warnings in 2018 when they teamed up with the Micronesian government to remove up to 173 oil tanks from the Prince Eugene. Eighty of the tanks were found to contain oil, which the crew carefully pumped out. Doing so was imperative to protecting the environment and the health of the local population, who have already suffered enough from the ill effects of radiation thanks to the nuclear testing that went on there decades ago. All of the remaining oil tanks are sealed off to prevent leftover clingage from polluting the water, and the Prince Eugene has become a popular diving site. Number 7. Davis Monthan Air Force Base The world's largest aircraft boneyard can be found in Tucson, Arizona at the Davis Monthan U.S. Air Force Base. There are over 4,400 decommissioned aircraft parked at the sprawling 1,200-acre site, nicknamed the Boneyard, where the dry desert heat slows down the inevitable rusting process. There are planes from all over the world at Davis Monthan, and many have been there for years. While it seems like they may be going to waste, most are waiting to be recycled or brought back to life. 
Some of the planes are broken down for their parts, which are shipped out and reused. Others are maintained so that they're ready to be brought back into service if the need arises. The Boneyard is home to countless models of aircraft, including a collection of decommissioned B-52 bombers that are stored with their wings removed. According to the BBC, this was done as part of a strategic arms limitation treaty between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, enabling Soviet satellites to see that the planes were taken out of service as promised. Some of the fighter jets at Davis-Monthan, including the F-4 Phantom II and the F-16, are being converted into aerial target drones. There's a lot more to storing a plane than simply parking it and letting it become an afterthought. Every plane that arrives at the Boneyard is drained of its fuel. Then, its fuel tank and lines are flushed out with a light oil to keep them lubricated. If a plane served on an aircraft carrier, it needs to be washed to avoid rusting from sea salt. Any and all explosive devices are removed from planes, small openings are covered with tape, and the aircraft is sprayed with several coats of easily removable paint to keep it as cool as possible and protect it from the harsh desert sun. Unfortunately, davis Monthan is not open to the public, being an active military site and all. There used to be bus tours, but they've been suspended indefinitely at the request of the Air Force. Number 6. Lockheed Martin Sea Shadow Designed for the U.S. Navy during the early 1980s, the Lockheed Martin Sea Shadow was an experimental ship that was built to explore the use of stealth technology on naval vessels. It was essentially designed to be the marine equivalent of the F-117 Nighthawk fighter jet. If it looks familiar, that's probably because the vessel in the Bond movie Tomorrow Never Dies was modeled after the Sea Shadow. The futuristic vehicle featured a science fiction-like swath, that is, a small water plane area twin hull design, which helped it stay stable even in rough seas. In fact, it was rated to withstand waves measuring up to 18 feet high, otherwise known as Sea State 6. The interior was very basic, yet contained several state-of-the-art automation systems not found in any other ships. Inside the Spartan ship, there were 12 bunks, a microwave, a table, and a fridge. But these fixtures didn't receive much use. The Sea Shadow was launched in 1984, but was kept secret from the public until 1993. Only one prototype was ever made, despite its capabilities. The Navy tried to auction it off in 2006, but nobody bought it. For the next six years, the Sea Shadow was stored inside of a mining bulge at Susun Bay in San Francisco, which was once home to an aging ghost fleet of abandoned ships. It was dismantled in 2012. Although the Sea Shadow itself never took off, the project wasn't a complete loss. The ship's distinctively shaped hull and stabilizer have been incorporated into many vessels, giving them an advantage with intelligence missions. Number 5. Murmansk The Soviet cruiser Murmansk was built during the early 1950s. It put in many years of service for the Soviet Union before it was decommissioned and sold to an India-based company for scrap in 1994. Plans were made to tow the ship from the Arctic Ocean to its new home, but the tugboat's cable snapped shortly after departing from Norway and the Murmansk ran aground. It sat in place with a heavy list for several years, becoming somewhat of a tourist attraction in the meantime. Fishermen and conservationists became increasingly concerned about the wrecked vessel's effects on the environment. Experts actually predicted that storms would destroy the ship a long time ago, yet it remained in one piece until 2009. That year, the Norwegian government finally had the Murmansk removed. The wreck was too damaged to be moved by conventional means, so workers built a breakwater and a dry dock around it. Once the ship dried up, they dismantled it piece by piece. Scientists ruled out the presence of polonium and other dangerous radioactive substances, but some researchers think that these findings are wrong. But if there were any hazardous chemicals on the Murmansk, we'll probably never know about it because the ship was recycled and is long gone. Number 4. Flamenco Beach Tanks There's a collection of rusting World War II-era tanks dotting the beach along Puerto Rico's Culebra Island. Covered in colorful graffiti, they look strangely out of place against the white sand and the turquoise Caribbean Sea. The American military began using Culebra Island in 1901 after Spain ceded Puerto Rico to the U.S. at the end of the Spanish-American War. That same year, President Theodore Roosevelt gave the island's public territory to the U.S. Navy. Although no official base was ever established at Culebra Island, the military carried out bombing and other weapons practice there for decades. At one point, the military tried evicting the local population from the island, but they fought back by staging peaceful protests against the Navy's occupation of their home. The military eventually conceded and agreed to leave Culebra Island. By 1975, there were few remaining signs of its former presence. Navy personnel cleaned up the smaller pieces of equipment that had been left behind, but the tanks are still there today, 
dotting the shoreline as they decay in the salty sea breeze. Number 3. Vozhdvizhenka Aircraft Graveyard Located in Russia's far east near the Sea of Japan, Vozhdvizhenka is a former Soviet airbase that dates at least as far back as the Cold War era. Relatively little is known about the site, which is home to at least 18 gutted Tupolev Tu-22M supersonic bombers. According to a declassified CIA document from 1969, Vozhdvizhenka was the only Soviet base east of the Ural Mountains that housed the Tupolev Tu-22M. Nicknamed the Blinder, it entered service in 1962 as the first supersonic bomber ever produced in the USSR. But the aircraft underperformed compared to its maker's expectations as far as range and speed go. The Tupolev Tu-22M was produced in small numbers and was difficult to fly and maintain. It was prone to crashing as well as pitching up and striking its tail during landing. But it was still used in war. In fact, it was one of the few Soviet bombers to ever see combat, having been used in the Iran-Iraq War and in skirmishes against Tanzania and Chad. Tu-22s were also sold to other countries including Libya and Iraq. Still, the aircraft's glory days were short-lived, and the seemingly post-apocalyptic atmosphere at Vozhdvizhenka is reminiscent of a bygone era. Number 2. Bartini Beriev VVA-14 Plane The Cold War was marked by a frenzied arms race between the US and the Soviet Union, who competed to amass a bigger and better stockpile just in case actual physical war broke out. One of the USSR's priorities was to prepare for possible deep-sea missile strikes. During the 1970s, the Soviet Navy worked to combat these threats with the development of the Bartini Beriev VVA-14 plane. This amphibious aircraft was tasked with defending the Soviet border by detecting American submarines. Named after Italian designer Robert Bartini, the strange-looking aircraft was perched on pontoons. Manned by a three-person crew, it was capable of vertical takeoff and could also take off and land in the water. The Bartini Beriev VDA-14 also worked by skimming along the water while it patrolled for enemy submarines. Only two prototypes were ever built, with one logging 103 flight hours over 107 flights before the project was ultimately scrapped. Just one of the prototypes survives today. It sits near the Russian Air Force Museum in Monino, outside Moscow. In 2013, a group of aviation enthusiasts campaigned for its revival, but their efforts were unsuccessful. Number 1. Chasaloup Laubat The port of Nuadibu in Mauritania functions as the world's largest ship graveyard. At any given time, you can find the holes of some 300 abandoned vessels at the site rotting away under the sun. The first ship to be left behind at Nuadibu was the French Navy cruiser Chasaloup Laubat. It was built during the 1890s in response to growing fears about what German and Italian naval fleets were capable of. After World War I, the French military decommissioned the vessel and sold it to a private fishery, which used it as a water cistern and a floating warehouse. The Chesaloup Laubat sank at Nuadibu in 1926, marking the beginning of the massive ship graveyard that's there now. The collection of derelict vehicles accumulated over time, largely due to corrupt politicians who are willing to take bribes from ship owners who are looking to skirt around environmental laws. At one point, the Chesaloup Laubat was converted into a floating theater. Soon enough, however, it went back to being nothing more than a hunk of rusting metal, much like all the other vessels in the port. The ship graveyard is a fascinating sight, but it's incredibly dangerous to the environment, especially since Mauritania lacks the infrastructure to properly dismantle the boats. Number 10. USS Bear The USS Bear went down in history as one of the Coast Guard's most famous ships. As a forerunner to modern icebreakers, the cutter enjoyed a lengthy career in the frigid Arctic and North Atlantic regions and even served in Antarctica for a short period. The ship was built in 1874, originally as a sealing vessel. Its military service started 10 years later in 1884 when the U.S. Navy bought it and used it for an Arctic rescue mission. After that, the ship worked as a Coast Guard cutter for over 40 years along Alaska's 20,000-mile coastline, searching for seal poachers, illicit traders, and whalers in need of help. The Bear also functioned as a floating courthouse, delivered food to hungry civilians, and ferried reindeer between Siberia and Alaska. From 1939 to 1941, it served in the U.S. Antarctic Service Expedition. Then, during World War II, the ship patrolled the waters off Greenland, making it the oldest Navy ship to be deployed outside the continental U.S. and one of the last ships with sails to be used in war. The Bear was finally retired from military service in 1948. 
Philadelphia businessman Alfred Johnston bought it in 1963 with plans to turn it into a floating restaurant. But the vessel foundered and sank 260 miles east of Boston while en route to its new home in California. The Coast Guard rediscovered the wreck in 2019, but only recently confirmed that it truly is the one and only USS Bear. It's unknown whether there are any plans to further explore it. Number 9. Sogol Tank Cemetery Just a few miles outside the German town of Sogol, there's a small field that contains around two dozen abandoned Leopard 1 and M47 Patton tanks, all arranged in neat lines. Strangely, nobody seems to know why they're there. And while the site is impossible to ignore, the German military is strangely secretive about the tanks. Designed by Porsche, the Leopard 1 tank functioned as a main battle tank for West Germany during the Cold War, when the country was split into two both ideologically and physically by the Berlin Wall. The Leopard 1 entered into service in 1965. Nearly 6,500 of the tanks were produced, and it became a popular choice among European militaries. The last of them were withdrawn from service in 2003 when they were replaced by the Leopard 2. The M47 was an American battle tank named after World War II General George S. Patton. It went into service in 1951 and was used primarily by the U.S. Army and Marine Corps. You may be surprised to learn that the M47 is the only American tank that the U.S. military has never used in combat. But it has seen war under other militaries and some are still in use today. There's no physical barrier stopping people from going near the mysterious collection of tanks, but there is a warning sign cautioning people against trespassing and threatening to prosecute anyone who enters the property. Some suspect that the tank cemetery is an active military site and that helicopter pilots use the vehicles for target practice. Number 8. Wild Eyes 16-year-old Abby Sunderland left Marina del Rey, California in early 2010 aboard her 40-foot yacht Wild Eyes with plans to sail around the world non-stop and all alone. Sailing was in the teen's blood. A year earlier, her brother Zach had become the first person under 18 years old to sail around the world. Shortly after he made the landmark achievement, the sibling's parents bought the blindingly yellow Wild Eyes for Abby and customized it for her upcoming trip. But things didn't go as smoothly as planned. Right off the bat, the Australian-built vessel encountered electrical and fuel problems, forcing Abby to restart her voyage 10 days later from Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Several months into her trip, the teen activated her emergency satellite beacons from a remote location in the Indian Ocean, halfway between Madagascar and Western Australia. The Wild Eyes was struggling against 50-foot waves and 60-knot winds. Thankfully, a French vessel rescued Abby. She left her banana yellow boat behind in the terrifying storm. Nobody saw the Wild Eyes again for almost nine years until an aircraft crew saw it floating upside down off southern Australia. The barnacle-covered yacht's signature eyes were faded, and the boat's mast had broken off during the storm that had forced its young captain to call for help. Seeing the vessel so many years later was an emotional experience for Abby, who said that she didn't expect it to ever be found. Number 7. Châtillon Car Graveyard Until recently, a forest near the village of Châtillon in southern Belgium was home to a massive collection of rusting cars. There are conflicting stories about where exactly they came from. According to one legend, the vehicles belonged to American soldiers who were stationed in the region during World War II. When they returned home at the end of the war, it would have been extremely expensive for the soldiers to have the cars they bought overseas shipped to the U.S. So they drove the vehicles up a hill and into the woods, parked them neatly in rows, and simply abandoned them. If the story is true, it means that none of the troops missed their deserted cars enough to retrieve them. Residents are quick to point out that many of the vehicles were post-World War II models pointing toward the possibility that the site was just an ordinary junkyard. Châtillon was once home to as many as four car graveyards, housing as many as 500 vehicles. But most have been removed, and local collectors have already taken anything they felt was worth keeping. Time has not been kind to the remaining cars, which are heavily eroded and decaying. Number 6. Kiska Submarine On the remote Aleutian Island of Kiska in Alaska, there's an orca-shaped World War II midget submarine sitting near the shore. The Japanese Navy brought six of them to the island when they occupied the region in 1942, but only one remains today, serving as a rusting, lonely reminder of one of the darkest chapters in world history. The battery-powered 78-foot submarine, which sat just two men, can be found in the grass off Kiska Harbor. Alluding to the claustrophobic environment the vehicle offered, archaeologist Deborah Corbett told the Anchorage Daily News that she couldn't imagine a worse job than having to operate one. Midget submarines like this could only dive about 100 feet and had a 90-mile range. They also couldn't be charged at sea, leaving ship crews tasked with recovering them. 
Researcher Richard Galloway clarified that the Kiska submarine wasn't a suicide vehicle, but that it also didn't have a high rate of survivability for its operators. The Japanese spent 14 months at Kiska, where as many as 7,200 soldiers were stationed. The American and Canadian militaries reclaimed Kiska in August 1943 as part of a joint mission called Operation Cottage. They expected the Japanese to resist, but they fled before the Allied forces even arrived. The submarine is one of the few reminders of their presence that remains today, but it will eventually rust away completely. Number 5. Eagle Lake and West Branch Locomotives Deep throughout the forests of northern Maine are the scattered remnants of the state's bygone logging industry, including two rusting steam-powered locomotives and a collection of aging machinery parts. At first glance, the site might look like a junkyard to some. But this equipment was much more impressive during its glory days when it was used for shuttling timber through the forest. The locomotives went into service in 1926. At the time, northern Maine was a major logging hub. They ran day and night, stopping for only 10 minutes between loads. After carrying nearly one million cords of pulpwood, the tramway was abruptly shut down by the Great Depression. By then, the two locomotives were obsolete. It would have cost more to move them out of the forest than it was to simply leave them there. They were parked at Eagle Lake and were basically forgotten about until they became an attraction to adventurers seeking to explore abandoned sites. Even though the trains were deserted and left to decay, they're maintained today. In 1996, one of the locomotives began leaning. Volunteers and government workers worked together to jack it up, restore the track underneath, and set the train back down in its final resting place. The project took three years and 5,200 five-gallon buckets of crushed stone, which were transported to the site by snowmobile in the brutal winter cold. Number four, aircraft graveyard. Near the tiny Hungarian village of Nagy Gimot, there's a curious plot of land containing an abandoned runway and over 30 military planes from bygone eras. The deserted property was built as an airbase during the 1930s. Today, it's located near an active, newer military base. In 1945, the Soviet Union took control of the site. It remained in operation until all its planes were decommissioned in 1997. Some of the aircraft were sold to museums and collectors, while others found a permanent home at the abandoned airbase. Their tanks were filled with cement so that nobody could try to fly them, and in 2001, all remaining military personnel left the site. There's a collection of Soviet-developed fighter jets at the property, including five Sukhoi Su-22s and 29 Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-21s. Both have a reputation for their impressive fighting capabilities. In fact, many countries have used the jets since they were introduced in the 1960s. Naturally, they were especially popular among the Eastern Bloc countries, including the Hungarian Air Force, which once employed over 250 MiG-21s. The aircraft are sinking into the mud due to the weight of the concrete in their engines. Meanwhile, scavengers are dismantling the historic decaying planes one piece at a time. Number 3. Overland Train Mark II During the 1950s, the U.S. government commissioned the Texas-based heavy equipment company Le Tourneau to design a massive off-road land train that was capable of hauling heavy loads of cargo over challenging terrain. These vehicles were originally meant to help with logging in the remote wilderness. Le Tourneau was tasked with building three land trains, the largest of which measured 572 feet long. Known as the TC-497 Overland Train Mark II, to this day it remains the largest off-road vehicle ever built. There were four large engines spread throughout the train, equipping it with 4,680 horsepower. Fully loaded, it could cover a distance between 350 and 450 miles. The six-wheeled cab was 30 feet tall and housed bathrooms, a kitchen, and sleeping quarters for up to six people. The Army began testing the Mark II in 1962. It performed well, but the gargantuan vehicle was slow, traveling at just 20 miles per hour on average. In addition to these speed challenges, heavy-duty cargo helicopters started coming out around the same time, essentially rendering the Mark II obsolete. The military ultimately abandoned the project, and the experimental vehicle was never used again. Most of it was sold for scrap, but the control cab remains on display at the Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona. Number 2. Częstochowa Train Graveyard Częstochowa is Poland's 13th most populous city, and it used to be one of the country's leading industrial centers. It's here that you'll find an abandoned train depot that was once a bustling transportation hub. During its heyday, the property connected the Warsaw Vienna Railway, which was founded in 1846 with the rest of Europe. Over time, six other rail stations popped up throughout the city, and the depot closed simply because it was no longer needed. Today, the disused train station and yard are home to an eerie population of aging rail cars that have been taken out of service. The site stands in stark contrast to Częstochowa's modern operating train stations. Częstochowa's landscape has changed considerably over the years. 
but the city of 240,000 residents is still very lively and it draws many tourists. There's an ongoing debate among many urban explorers over whether the depot is a genuine train graveyard or a neglected part of a large depot. Technicalities aside, it's fascinating in its own right, drawing many off-the-beaten-path adventurers hoping to catch a first-hand glimpse of a piece of history that wasn't intended as a tourist attraction. Number 1. Excavator Graveyard In northeastern Germany, there's an open-air museum of industrial machines known as Ferropolis. It contains five massive excavators that were left behind at the site of a former East German coal mine. They're thought to be the world's biggest collection of deserted diggers, each weighing up to 2,000 tons. Built in 1941, the Mosquito is the site's oldest digger. It took between three and five operators to run the 223 by 92 foot monster. Mad Max, a 263 foot wide digger dating back to 1952, also required a three to five person crew. Between five and seven operators were required to operate the 320 foot long Medusa, which was built in 1959. At 410 feet long, the Gemini digger is the largest of the machines. Six to eight people were needed to control the contraption, which dates back to 1958. The newest digger is the Big Wheel. Built in 1984, the 102 by 246 foot required between three and five operators. Nobody has used the machine since mining stopped in 1991, shortly after Germany reunified. But they're legally protected, and in 1995 the site reopened as Ferropolis, giving the public a chance to see the gargantuan diggers up close. Number 10. Camp Sentry Camp Sentry was built in 1959 by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, deep underground in Greenland. It was created about 150 miles from the Thule Air Base in one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. Temperatures here can reach as low as negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, with winds at a blistering 125 miles per hour. The annual snowfall is over 4 feet. But despite these extreme challenges, the Army constructed a sprawling base beneath the surface of the ice within just two short years. It housed about 200 soldiers and used a PM2 portable nuclear reactor to power all the equipment. Naturally, this was a very secret base. All the work they were doing in Greenland was covered up as scientific research. But in truth, Camp Sentry was built for Operation Iceworm which was an attempt to figure out how to deploy nuclear missiles from under the ice. The attempt was a failure though. The Army had wanted to build a significantly larger base capable of deploying at least 600 missiles at one time. Camp Sentry was supposed to have 60 launch control centers and 11,000 soldiers living day and night beneath the ice. But none of this proved technically feasible and Project Iceworm was canceled in 1963. The Greenland ice sheet was simply too unstable. The army was in constant danger of their tunnels collapsing. And if they started shooting off nuclear bombs, their whole facility would have undoubtedly fallen apart. If the project continued, it's highly likely that millions of dollars worth of equipment, along with many lives, would have been lost. Number 9. Secret CIA Weapons Facility Just north of San Antonio in Texas, there is Camp Stanley, a low-key military weapons storage facility. It's also home to some of the most mysterious weapons in the CIA's arsenal, including a wildly dangerous explosive stockpile. At least, this is according to documents leaked by a retired CIA official who happens to live in the San Antonio area. This base is referred to by those who know its contents as the Midwest Depot. It has been tied to rebel groups from Nicaragua, fighters in Afghanistan, and even Cuban exiles before the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. This is the base where all the weapons that arm the rebels allegedly come from. Retired CIA analyst Alan Thompson is the one who's giving the press a lot of this information. Thompson claims all those AK-47s and RPGs that you see being waved around on TV by militant fighters in the Middle East, yeah, they come from this secret CIA weapons facility in San Antonio. But just to be clear, this is all based on documents published by Thompson. We know he did indeed work for the CIA between 1972 and 1985, but the facility has never actually let anyone in to see what kind of weapons they might be hiding. Number 8. Secret Nazi Hideaway There is a secret Nazi base in a rather unlikely place, and on the opposite side of the world than you might be thinking. 
This base, a covert Nazi hideaway, can be found today in the middle of the Andean jungle of Argentina. As you may already know, Argentina has a long history with Nazi Germany. They were pro-Nazi in the 1940s, and in the aftermath of the war, Argentina harbored plenty of war criminals. If you were a bad guy in Germany, you could flee to Argentina, and many did. Well, archaeologists have now discovered a physical piece of this rather disturbing history. Researchers with the University of Buenos Aires found three abandoned buildings in the middle of the jungle in the provincial park of Teucuare that were built specifically for sheltering fugitive Nazis. They found all kinds of artifacts within the abandoned buildings, such as German coins, German porcelain dishes that undoubtedly came from Europe, and even swastikas carved into the stone of the structure. The research team told local news they believe the site is connected to a plot to house the last remnants of Nazi leadership in the Argentine jungle. But unfortunately, we don't actually know who was hiding here, for how long, or where they went after getting tired of living in the jungle. There are some that believe Hitler himself stayed in one of these secret bases, though there is no actual proof that he stayed in these ones. Number 7. The Cunha Field Station Navy Base The Cunha Field Station is an intelligence base for the Navy and Army, first developed after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. The Army knew that they needed a serious base in Hawaii that would be able to withstand an attack by an enemy, or preferably see one coming and prevent it from ever happening. After the surprise of Pearl Harbor, America was not interested in being snuck up on again. The base was built mostly underground, completely bombproof, just 15 miles 24 kilometers, from Honolulu. In the final year of World War II, Kunia turned into an intelligence and cryptologic compound. I'm talking about communications, host support, and things like that. Kunia has always been occupied by intelligence forces. The more time went on, the more modern the base got and the more sophisticated the intelligence. While it's impossible for us to say what's going on in the base today, we do know that Edward Snowden worked at Kunia. And we all know Edward Snowden, the guy who revealed top secret information from the PRISM surveillance program. You know, the one where the US Army was proved to be spying on every single US citizen. Well, this is the base where all that spy data was getting analyzed. Do you believe the government is really spying on everyone? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and if you are liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. Alaskan Area 51 We've all heard of Area 51, but did you know that Alaska has its very own Area 51 type base? Well it does. In fact, Alaska has plenty of military bases and abandoned projects throughout its vast wilderness. One of the most fascinating is something called the High Aural Aurora Research Project. The secret military base operated from between 1990 and 2014 with help from the United States Air Force and the United States Navy. But nobody actually knows what really went on here. We know that the main component of the facility was an ionospheric research instrument, which is a type of phased array of antennas evenly spaced over a massive patch of 33 acres of land. The instrument radiated about 3.6 megawatts directly into the ionosphere. It makes sense that the station was used to study the Earth's atmosphere, but some people think there was something else going on. Some believe the giant array of antennas may have been used to control the weather, and if not to control the weather, then to disrupt communications systems in Russia. But the truth is that this is all speculation, and we just don't know. Number 5. Russia's Arctic in 2021, satellite images revealed a giant buildup of Russian military in the Arctic. The satellite images were reported by CNN, with the news agency going on to say that Russia is amassing an unbelievably huge military force in the Arctic. What are they doing in their secret Arctic base? That's probably something the US military would love to know for themselves. All we can say for sure, based on the satellite photographs, is that they are testing new weapons in the region. And because the Arctic is very quickly losing a lot of its ice and getting warmer, it's the perfect time to start building bases in a bid to secure the area and lock down some major shipping routes from between Asia and Europe. And here's where things get really scary. Russia also appears to be testing out an unmanned stealth torpedo, 
a super weapon called the Poseidon 2M39. Christopher A. Ford with International Security says these torpedoes are capable of overflowing coastal American cities with radioactive tsunamis. Number 4. A Base in the Ice Vostok Station was founded by the Soviet Union in 1957. It's located in Princess Elizabeth Land, Antarctica, and is used today as a research station. It's the southern pole of cold, where daily temperatures can reach a shocking negative 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. From what we know, their research includes drilling into the ice and magnetometry. This means they are constantly observing changes to the magnetosphere of our planet. They also study geophysics, climatology, and medicine. There are normally 25 scientists and engineers here in the summer, with only 13 staying through the winter. Living here is basically like living in space. In fact, living at this isolated station can cause serious problems. In 1959, a man got so upset after one of the other scientists beat him in a game of chess that he attacked the other man with an ice axe and murdered him. The Soviets then banned the game chess at their stations. And while we don't know if this base is doing any secret military work, we definitely can't rule it out. If the US had a secret nuclear base in Greenland and covered it up as a research station for decades, it's safe to say the Russians could do the same thing. Number 3. Inside Cheyenne Mountain The Cheyenne Mountain Complex is without a doubt one of the most indestructible secret bases anywhere on American soil. It's located in the Cheyenne Mountain of Colorado Springs, literally inside the mountain. It was designed back in the 1950s during the height of the Cold War to be the most hardened command and control center in the US. If things would ever go completely sideways, this was where the main heads of state and all those most important government people would be bunkering down and commanding the military. In fact, the Cheyenne Mountain Complex is still very functional today. When it first opened in the later part of the 1960s, it was the main NORAD Combat Operations Center. They mainly just watched for any missiles that might be sent to North America. But over time, the bunker evolved. It now houses military operations from just about every branch, including the Air Force Space Command, the U.S. Strategic Command, and the U.S. Northern Command. Stephen Rose, the deputy director of the complex, says there are over a dozen different government and Department of Defense agencies working inside. Some of them are so secret he can't even publicly name them. Number 2. Lookout Mountain Laboratory Lookout Mountain Laboratory is a secret film studio used by the U.S. military and located in the Hollywood Hills. But this is one film studio whose name you are not supposed to remember. For the past 20 years, the military has created thousands of films at this one laboratory, and they've all been classified. The studio was established in secret in 1947, first to create videos on atomic bomb tests that were taking place in Nevada, New Mexico, and the South Pacific. Between 1947 and 1969, about 19,000 classified films were made here, more than actual Hollywood productions. There are also rumors that the military has helped conduct advanced research for Hollywood, perhaps even involved with 3D technology. It's even been said that Hollywood brass were given special clearance to check out the facility at Lookout Mountain. Though, to be completely honest, we have no idea what Hollywood bigwigs and top U.S. officials could possibly be colluding about at the most secret film studio in the world. Number 1. Abandoned Afghanistan Base There was once a secret base outside Kabul in Afghanistan, a place where some pretty terrible atrocities took place. There was a compound here called Eagle Base, where the U.S. trained Afghan counterterrorism units. They also had a detention center called the Salt Pit, where so much torture was carried out, the U.S. government had to create formal CIA guidelines on how they were to conduct interrogation. This was mainly because of Gul Rahman in 2002, who died from hypothermia. This guy was chained to a wall and left overnight half naked as part of his interrogation. For over two decades, this base was only visible in satellite photographs and only spoken of by survivors who escaped. 
And now that the Americans have completely left Afghanistan, the base is dead. It's been burned to cinders. The sudden departure of the American troops saw helicopters whisking everyone away from the base. Everything that had any kind of secret information was burned, and the entire complex is now a ruin. Thanks for watching. What kinds of classified films do you think are being stored at Lookout Mountain Laboratory? Let us know your theories in the comments, and don't forget to hit subscribe for more awesome videos. See you next time. Bye!